I mean, you're, you're traveling along at, at 70 miles an hour and you see this billboard that tries to condense so much and so little, and I wonder how helpful it actually is. Now, I know that many of you would prefer if theologians learned to keep things short and to the point and sweet, um, but so often when we try to do that, right, when we try to collapse these big ideas into these short phrases, not only is something lost a lot of the time, uh, but we end up sort of veering into dangerous waters, right? We come very close to, to transgressing some, some big lines. And that usually happens on a day like today in the church, right? When we uh, try to celebrate and honor the mystery that is the Trinity. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I've certainly heard sermons, whether they're sermons uh, like this or children's sermons, that try to explain the Trinity using images that, well, it may sound nice, they're not probably the most helpful. Um, you know, the, 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 the old favorite is God is like water. There's you know, you have ice, you have steam, you can have the liquid itself, right? So there's solid, liquid, gas. And the problem with that is, right, that, that means that God really isn't three distinct persons in one, but that there are three modes by which God appears. It's a heresy, actually, called modalism that the church rejected long ago. Or the other favorite example people like to use is like God's like an apple, right? There's the skin and the flesh and the seeds. Well, the problem there is that you're veering awfully close to this thing called tripartinarianism, where you're saying God has three parts, not three persons. Again, learning with Paris here. And so while it might be a, a lot easier to try to condense things, right, for, for our own sake, um, it, it isn't often the best way to do it. And there are times, right, uh, when we want to really try to explain things, but we can't do it in a few words. That's why we have these things like the Athanasian Creed, right? Because when the church has tried to shrink stuff down, um, it, it can't really shrink it all that much sometimes. And, and when you're talking about something like the Trinity, we can't really explain it. We can only confess it. It's when we try to explain it that we get into trouble. And there have been no shortages of attempts to explain it, sometimes well-meaning, most of the times well-meaning, uh, but sometimes using our Old Testament text, right? Because there in our Old Testament text, the angel says, holy, holy, holy. And certainly it's holy, 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 because there are three persons of the Trinity. And while that may preach really well on Trinity Sunday, it's kind of not the point of the text. Let's just take a step back and look at that text for what's going on, right? In the year that King Uzziah died, so we have to ask ourselves, who's King Uzziah? Well, he was this king of Judah, okay? And, and he has passed, um, and, and the chapters leading up to chapter 6 are, are not all that happy um, in terms of what is coming for Israel. There, there's some bad things on the brink. Uh, chapter 5, especially, if you've got time to go back and read it, see what's going on, what's going to come down the pipe, and, and now the king of Judah is dead, and, and Isaiah is given this vision of, of God whose glory fills the whole earth. And it's, it's a weird kind of vision, isn't it? Uh, because you see him on this throne, and he is high and lifted up. The throne is the thing that's high and lifted up, God is. Um, and, and you have these, these seraphim, right, that have six wings, and it's this weird kind of picture, and we don't know what really to do with it in our mind's eye. Uh, but they're, the, these angels are calling out one to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, right? Yahweh of Sabaoth, um, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And, and, you know, this is such an awesome event that the foundations of the temple are shaking and smoke is filling the room. Now, you have to think about this sort of in opposition to the other guy in town whose glory was starting to fill the earth. This guy named Tilgath Pileaser, the king of Assyria, right? His, his, his glory, his reputation, his power, all that kind of stuff is starting to ramp up. And those of us who remember our Old Testament well know that Assyria is going to take out part of Israel. Right? I mean, it's just going to happen. And so, on the one hand, you have this, this sort of reality that Isaiah lives in, where Assyria is gaining strength, and, and you know that, that God has said Israel is going to suffer a little, but then he gets this picture of this throne that God is sitting on, whose glory doesn't just fill the region like a series, but whose glory fills the entire heaven and earth, everything that has been created. In other words, Isaiah is getting a picture.
picture of who is really in charge here. It's not the king of Assyria. It's the one who sits on the throne. And Isaiah is undone by this. Right? He's, he's, he is so um, in awe and, and has fear and trembling as he gazes upon this vision that he says, Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips amidst the people of unclean lips. Now, lips, you know, it doesn't just mean his lips are dirty. It's, it's, it's his whole sort of self. Right? And it's not just him, it's all of the people. They are recognizing their brokenness. But what Isaiah does in the face of this um, tremendous vision of who God is in all of his splendor and glory, he falls to his knees in repentance because he sees God for who God is. He gets it. He may not be able to explain it, but he gets it. And so what happens, right? The, the, this, one of the seraphim come and, and they take one of the coals, right? And, and they use tongs and they touch it to his lips. And in touching it to his lips, his sin is atoned for. He is made clean. He can now stand in the presence of God. Because God is what? Holy, holy, holy. See, the reason why there are three is it because God is triune? And it's nice, but that's not the point. If you want to emphasize something in Hebrew, you repeat it. In other words, the point is that this God who sits on the throne is really, really, really pure and undefiled and set apart from all others in the earth. This God is a God unlike any other. And the proper response when you are in his presence is to fall down on your knees and repent. Because you and this God, myself and this God, we don't belong in the same room. And yet, we are in the same room today. Right? And that's kind of what the gospel text is all about. I don't, I don't need to recount all of that, uh, because we, we know these verses well, especially the verses at the end, right? John 3, 16, everybody puts it up on a sign or on a billboard on the highway, right? This, this notion that God the Father has loved the world so much that he sent his son, right? And so it's not just, a, 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 it's not just an amount of love he has, right, so much, but that he loves the world in this way. He so loves the world that he would send his son to stand in our place, to die the death we deserve, to take the sins of the world upon his shoulders, die and rise again, and that this Son would then send the Spirit to bring that atonement throughout the world, through a number of means, right? Through the word preached and read, through the water that is poured on our heads, and yes, even through something that touches our lips and makes us clean very body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the other week I was um, down, or last week when I came back, I was down in Baltimore for this meeting uh, where your brother-in-law was, Elliot Robertson, down at Martini, and I learned from Elliot something I had never known before, and that is the music we are singing this morning, the, the old service uh, hymnal, um, that music setting started in Baltimore. Like the actual music was composed in Baltimore. Um, and so if, when, when you think about our liturgy, right, um, there are these moments where I think we get a lot of things right. Uh, and, and one of the things I think we get right is after, is, is as we're doing the service of the sacrament, right, uh, just before the words of institution, we sing the Sanctus. And the Sanctus is what? It's these words from Isaiah 6. We repeat the same thing in the presence of God that Isaiah did in this vision, recognizing that he is holy, 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 Lord of hosts, or uh, as, as sometimes it's, it's put, Lord of armies. He is this strong God who is really in charge, whose awe and majesty and glory fill the heavens and the earth, and we sing it just before we receive his body and blood. It's something I think we get right. 
because we are in the presence of the Lord. That's, I mean, that, 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 that whole Isaiah might be seer in days of old, right? That was Luther's version of the Sanctus from that setting five that none of us really like. Um, but I really like it, and partly because it moves the Sanctus a little more in the service. Not before the words of institution, but after. And, and when God is in the room, we are, we are recounting and remembering this moment that Isaiah had where he stood before the almighty God and was undone by the majesty and glory of who this is that has come into his presence. Who sends a seraphim to touch his lips with the hot coal that he might be who now, in our day, gives bread and wine to touch our lips, that we might be home. I mean, it's this wonderful sort of parable. But there's something we shouldn't forget. Isaiah 6 doesn't end at chapter 7, or verse 7. It, it, there, there's another chunk there. Because Isaiah isn't just redeemed for his own sake. He isn't just atoned for for his own sake. No, he's got a message he's got to go out and get. And it's a message that he ends up persecuting for. The same is true for you and I. The moment we have at the rail, right? The moment we have on a Sunday morning where God comes to us and cleanses us and reminds us who we are and what he has done for us, it's not only just for us. It's that we might go out into the world and declare the mystery of the Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity. That we might declare the glory of the God that fills the heavens and the earth. Right? This awesome, inspiring uh, thing that we cannot comprehend. That we cannot always explain. That we might look like fools to the rest of the world for believing in. We confess it with our lips because our lips have been touched and made clean by his very body and blood. We can't explain the mystery, but we certainly can confess that the God we have come to worship this morning in praise and thanksgiving, the God who comes to us this morning through word and sacrament, he really is holy, holy, holy Lord of hosts heaven and earth are full of his glory. Amen.